Welcome public inventors. Uh, this is going to be a uh, video to show some work that I've done. Uh, one of the mottos we have at Public Invention is to work in the light and so I'm showing you something that is not quite ready for publication but it's something I've been working on a long time. This is currently available at one of my GitHub uh, repositories called Segmented Helices or Segmented Helixes um, and it's something that came out of the Mathathon, which happened in December, which a number of people assisted me with, and I'm very grateful for that. We had a virtual Mathathon, and in it we discovered the thing which was surprising to me that any repeated construction of, in that case, tetrahedra, stuck together always produced a helix if you use the same rule to produce it. Uh, a helix not unlike the one that you're seeing right here. And after a little thought, it became apparent that, in fact, any repeated structure produces a helix, although the shape of the helix, of course, depends on the way the structure is put together. And that's what you're seeing on the screen here. These are various helices created by different parameters, all from a central object whose face is, can, you can change the face, uh, change the normal vector defining the face and of course that changes the the helix but it's the same object repeated each time always putting the same face to the the same face so uh, in this construction we've used prisms with a triangular face because that's kind of the simplest mechanical system uh, to work with and you, there's something extraordinary happening here which may not be completely apparent. You'll notice that the thin green line goes through the center of each joint and that happens even out to the end um, and you might think it's being drawn between the joints but in, in fact that's not true. What we've done is develop the mathematics for a segmented helix a helix which is not continuous but composed of uh, segments or polylines and develop the math which is expressed here in terms of radius and the, the degree theta and the travel along the z direction. Um, sometimes the travel is positive, sometimes the travel is negative. Um, and uh, the angle with respect to the uh, z-axis which is drawn with my little protractors on on the screen here and it, and uh, allow you to input the angle tau which is the twist occurring at the face as you bring the angle tau closer to zero in this case it's negative 3.9 the spiral becomes tighter and eventually if you put zero in it folds on itself as you can see here, forming a ring or a torus, which is in fact just a degenerate kind of helix. And then if you add to um, tau, the helix unfolds itself. Now, uh, the objects here are being placed mathematically face to face based on the rigidity of those prisms. That is, this would be true with any prisms. You could place them face to face and you would end up with a helix. But the green helical line, which happens to coincide exactly with the joint structures is being computed by a completely different algorithm. Now um, that algorithm is uh, based on work by Peter Kahn from about 20 years ago uh, which is in the realm of chemistry and I've combined it by uh, work that I should credit to Eric Lord um, who is the only person that I've seen uh, that I've been able to find who put into writing in a paper uh, again about 20 years ago, uh, what I call Lord's Observation. And Lord's Observation is the um, uh, assertion, perhaps it has not been formally proven yet, that any object which is used by a repeated sub as a repeated substructure and, and conjoined using the same rule for how it is to be joined, in this case I'm using a face-to-face -face joint rule, always produces a helix. I call that Lord's observation. Uh, as far as I know, he's the only person who's, who's put it in writing. Um, so now, uh, having developed this, you can ask, well, okay, what's the point of, of all of this? Uh, like, why is this, why is this valuable? Well, having the mathematics, which tells you 
the radius, the curvature, the travel, the uh, degree theta, which is the rotation about the axis of the um, helix, and in fact, the where the axis is relative to the axis of the object which you're producing, which I call phi in this case. Um, all of those things allow you to engineer a helix by designing the substructural unit, or at least more easily. You can engineer a helix of a given radius or a given length by designing the shape of the substructure, the cell, if you will, which you're going to produce. Now, someone might say, well, why would you do that? Well, if you were a carpenter, you could use this to design a helix that, for example, wrapped around a old stone tower or a tree. You could design a helical staircase in this way that had the properties that you wanted. But perhaps more compelling is you're a chemist and you, you want to solve this problem either in the forward direction or the reverse direction. And I can give you a, a little bit of an example of that. Suppose you have a... Um, chemical structure which you believe to be a dodecahedron. And an example might be, maybe, I'm not a chemist, but you're creating a buckyball or a nanostructure of some kind, and you've got some crystal which is a cube or a dodecahedron or some other shape. And because you know the shape, you understand the way they have to be joined at the faces is regular. Now it doesn't have to, molecules don't really have faces, but if the rule for conjoining two subunits is always the same, then Lord's observation applies to it. And here we have a helix constructed out of the platonic solid of the dodecahedron. And you'll notice that it matches right here, the helical structure matches the joints and the faces all perfectly match. Now we, when you make a dodecahedron, you can choose the angle of rotation, that is the tau angle between the faces, and choosing 72 degrees or negative 72 degrees changes the chirality or the handedness of the structure. And changing between 144 degrees and 72 degrees changes the shape of the helix rather drastically, one being kind of of a tight radius and one, this one being kind of of a loose radius. And this has been accomplished for any platonic solid, I've, I've put it in here, here's an octahedron, so this would be called an octahelix. So in particular, the tetrahelix, or the burdick coxeter helix, has been known for a long time, and it's been studied um, in, in a way, and this is a fine visual example of a tetrahelix, it's been studied in a way uh, more than the other platonic helixes, so that the radius and the formula for these uh, features in particular this angle, 131.81 degrees, has been known um, analytically. That is, there's a closed form expression developed by Coxeter um, that describes the tetrahelix. Once again, we can change certain parameters. Um, if, you may, if you use the zero face, uh, the tetrahelix folds in on itself, or you can change the handedness of the, the te tetrahelix. Now, um, However, as far as I know, although the cubicle case is, is rather simple, it's interesting, this exposes the fact that there exists a helix within this shape, even though if you looked at the cube, normally a human being wouldn't say, oh, there's a helix inside there. Well, there is. Um, by the prism, uh, which goes from one face to the other, and uh, it's kind of like a low poly helix. Uh, it's actually rather attractive, the sort of staircase structure. But it also exists uh, for the other platonic solids. Now, um, the existence of the tetrahelix was perhaps surprising when it was discovered. That's, that's why it's named the Burdick-Coxeter helix. Um, and I, I don't know if it's obvious that these other helices exist or not. Um, they certainly have been named and mentioned loosely in a variety of papers. Like you can find other papers talking about the dodecahelix and the icosahelix uh, and, and other structures, and so it, it's obvious that th these things exist. However, as far as I know, no one has ever given the mathematics for, for example, computing the radius and the travel and the relative angles of the dodecahelix. Um, so what I've done is taken Peter Kahn's algorithm 
and significantly modified it uh, and in certain ways simplified it to allow these parameters of the segmented helix to be computed directly from the substructure. Well, what's the substructure in this case? Well, it's the dodecahedron, which has faces at um, fixed angles to each other, which are, are expressed as the normals here, um, and then uh, be able to compute the parameter of the helix, which goes through all of those um, uh, uh, face points. So. Um, by having this mathematics, it allows you to potentially design a helix by designing a substructure, or a chemist might say, ah, well, I know my structure through some crystallography or by other means. I know I have, a, for example, in the realm of proteins, an alpha helix, or in the realm of crystallography, I might have a helix generated by gold atoms or carbon atoms or something like that. I would like to know what the substructure is. I'd like to know what the per, what the structure of a single cell is, having known the uh, uh, parameters of the helix, but not necessarily knowing the uh, parameters of the substructure. Well, having the mathematics in a algorithm makes it much easier to go back and forth designing or uh, reverse engineering those um, various uh, uh, e e either direction. Um, now, um, I'm being a little coy here by saying algorithm versus closed form expression. The truth is the algorithm uh, that, that Khan created, which I call the Khan Axis algorithm and I've modified, um, is almost a closed form expression. The problem is it's of such complexity when I an analyze it with Mathematica that although it, it does technically produce uh, what would be called um, an algebraic expression for the radius rather than a numerical one and the, and the angle here in the travel based only on trigonometric and uh, radical functions. It's of such complexity that I don't believe a human being can understand it in most cases. And so it, it, th therefore I call it an algorithm rather than a formula, but you could describe it as a formula um, but in practice, I think a anyone is going to use a computer, as I'm doing right now, to study um, the relationship between the helix and the physical structure, rather than being able to do much more than deduce anything from it, uh, um, except maybe to take some qualitative uh, derivatives. It might be possible to um, understand that, but it, even then, it's probably easier for any mathematician working with this to work with the interactive code, which you're seeing right here, um, and and the algorithms, of course, which are available behind it, uh, to understand the relationship between uh, whatever it is they're interested in studying, the helix, the set of molecules, possibly the nanostructure, possibly a uh, mechanical engineer would be interested in this to make a space frame, um, a three-dimensional truss structure, either for some uh, high-performance uh, uh, mission or maybe even a, a space-based uh, mission, an outer space-based mission, I mean. Um, so uh, I'm, it, this took me a really long time to do. I'm a little embarrassed to say I've been working on this. It's, it's now May. I've been working on it five months since the... Um, Mathathon, and uh, although I built on the work of Peter Kahn and the observation uh, by Eric Lord of, of some of this this stuff, I don't believe anyone has ever done this before, and I don't believe anyone has ever been able to compute the radius, uh, the the angle of rotation, the travel, and the angle um, analytically or algorithmically from the input features. Uh, which I've defined here, and n nobody has been able to do, well, I say that, nobody's been able to do it for the platonic helices uh, directly. Um, they may have done it in, in special cases, but nobody's been able to do it generally for the platonic helices, and this, in fact, works for arbitrary objects, which I'm expressing here as a prism because that's the minimal uh, aspect of the object that, that you need to um, describe the structure. So uh, why am I doing all this? This may be a little preliminary as far as like a mathematical uh, 
proposal would be because I haven't written the paper. There's certainly a draft in the GitHub repo that you're welcome to read, although it is a work in progress. It's, it's not ready for a uh, professional mathematician to read it unless they wanted to contribute to it. And so, as always, public invention, everything we do is open source. Uh, we're not trying to claim any intellectual property on anything except to prevent other people from uh, monopolizing things. Um, this project is, uh, as all of our projects, open to collaboration. Um, I consider uh, a majority of the heavy lifting done by the JavaScript code that you're seeing here, um, and so I use Mathematica as well um, in developing some of the, some of these algorithms. Um, however, there's pl still plenty of work to do. If, for example, a, a bright undergraduate math student wanted to help me flesh out the table for all of the platonic solids or the Archimedean solids, that would be another challenge. Um, and perhaps even seek closed form expressions of these objects. For example, if we go back to the octahedron here and look at these, um, these things, there's probably an analytic expression of the radius for an octahelix, um, not just a numeric one. But finding it will be a real challenge. Uh, it, it, and it might be simple. It might be, you know, square root of five or something, or it might be something very very complex. So um, the, the paper is not really written. The software is written. I think the main points have been elucidated. But again, at Public in, uh, Invention, our plan is to work in the light and we in, invent in the public for the public. So um, the reason I'm making this rather long-winded, although I think necessary, video is to show, um, uh, is to invite people to contribute uh, e even though in a certain sense this is not as researchy now, it, it's reduced to just work. Uh, for example, um, it may be, certainly in the case of the icosahedron, um, it's the case that uh, uh, someone needs to figure out how to name all of the faces so that this, um, uh, we could build a table of all possible icosahelices. In what you're seeing here, I've chosen one face. And in fact, an astute observer will notice that there's actually a bug here in somehow in my icosahedral math, which is different than the others. The faces don't quite line up. If you can see my mouse here, um, there's a little uh, misalignment between the faces uh, that needs to be worked out. And you, you'll probably find also the uh, LaTeX paper that I'm writing is, you know, currently... I, I would say worse than a rough draft, probably has erroneous things in it. Um, and the JavaScript code is messy because I've been, been hacking on it uh, as fiercely as I can for, for, for all this time. Um, but nonetheless, um, there are opportunities for collaboration if someone uh, is particularly excited by this area of mathematics or particularly um, wants to contribute to this kind of work. Um, so, unfortunately, I'm not a professional mathematician. I'm, I have a PhD in computer science. Um, I don't know how valuable this is, but I assume it's worth a journal paper in mathematics, uh, uh, not necessarily because it was intellectually difficult to achieve this. After all, I only built upon Kahn's algorithm and did a bunch of detailed work uh, exploring other things. For example, there are special cases uh, when, um, when tau is 180 that you have to take care of. This I call the zigzag case. Um, and there are other cases, uh, linear cases that are degenerate that you have to you have to deal with, and and so forth. And worked out the math and simplified some of uh, some of his algorithm uh, to make it a little closer to an analytical expression uh, than what he had produced. Um, but I don't know if previous to this it was obvious that you could al always generate a helix. And that those helices had known properties based on the substructure, and 
that now having that we could build a table of for example all of the helices generated by the platonic solids which um, I'm hoping to be a contribution. So thank you for putting up with this uh, being a little long-winded but math is a little hard to explain. Um, you're welcome to visit the GitHub repo uh, where this all of this is uh, freely available. The code is available under the GNU public license and the uh, textual material is available under the Creative Commons license and you can um, see this. You don't have to uh, uh, download anything if you just point your browser to the link at the github repo you will be running exactly the code that I have been showing you here thank you very much